Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Roger Mason, and I currently serve as the Senior Vice President for National Security Intelligence for Noblest Corporation, and it's a distinct privilege for me to introduce this uh, very special and important panel. So first of all, welcome to the final session of Summit 2015, State of National Intelligence. This is truly a unique session, during which time the directors from the national intelligence agencies, the leaders charged with ensuring the health of the nation's human, SIGINT, GEOINT, MAZINT, and domestic intelligence capabilities will share their assessments of their respective domains and their priorities, plans, and partnerships that they consider essential to their success. As with previous panels, uh, there's no way to introduce this group individually without exceeding even the extra time that we had allotted for this session. So instead, I will only say welcome and thank you for being here to the director of CIA, John Brennan, the director of NGA, Robert Cardillo, the director of NSA and commander, U.S. Cyber Command, Admiral Mike Rogers, the director of NRO, Betty Sapp, the director of DIA, Lieutenant General Vincent Stewart, and the FBI director, James Comey. Joining this august group as moderator is Ms. Catherine Herridge, chief intelligence correspondent for the Fox News Channel. Please join me in welcoming this incredibly accomplished group. Well, thank you and good afternoon. I'm extremely grateful and humbled to have the opportunity to moderate this panel today with the principal players of the U.S. intelligence community at a time when national security has been at the fore and when events overseas impact the United States here at home, not in years or months, but in days and hours because of the speed of social media. I'm also grateful to AFSIA International and INSA for this opportunity and for bringing together this group, which I believe is a reflection of their hard work and also the prestige of this summit. Uh, the game plan for today is that each of the principals will uh, briefly address the audience uh, for two to three minutes with an opening statement. We're then going to move to 45 minutes of discussion. Uh, our hope is that this discussion will allow you to see the dialogue that takes place in private every day, but you'll have a rare chance uh, to see it in public. And then we're going to open it up for your questions uh, for the balance probably between 20 and 30 minutes. Uh, and with that, I'd ask uh, Director Comey on my left to begin, please. Okay. Thank you, Catherine, and it's good to be here with my colleagues. My goal is not to reveal too much of any of our private conversations, <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm in a comfortable chair, so you never know what will happen. Um, I have something on my mind that, is, uh, that affects all the work we do as an intelligence community, but also affects uh, our law enforcement responsibilities, and it's this. I think the American people should be skeptical of government power and of our authorities and the ways in which we use them. But I'm very concerned that that skepticism has bled over to cynicism. And we feel it in policing. We feel it in our federal law enforcement work. We feel it when we're debating our authorities. We feel it when we talk about the problem that uh, all of us have discussed, which is going dark. And it is something that is getting in the way of reasoned discussion and is making it very, very hard for us to have a healthy conversation about our authorities and how we use them. I am very concerned about how to reverse that trend of cynicism. Again, from the police on the beat, I worry there's two lines going in opposite directions, the citizens that the police protect and the police themselves, but I see it in cynicism when we try to explain there really is a problem with universal strong encryption and it's colliding with something we also care very much about, which is security on the internet and we're met with venom sometimes and deep cynicism about that, and that is obscuring healthy discussion. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us. I'll be in this job for another eight years. I don't know how long my colleagues will be with us. Uh, I, hope, I hope that whole time. Let's hope not eight more yeah, years. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually think one of the things we have to talk about in addition to the issues that dominate our day-to-day -day lives is how do we get to a healthier place in discussing authority uh, in the American public square. Thank you. Director Comey. Uh, Director Brennan, please. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. It shows that you have a deep interest in intelligence issues and 
national security affairs. Uh, everything that Jim said, I would agree with, uh, but also I think it's quite poignant to note, and I'm sure it has been already in the summit, that tomorrow will be the 14th anniversary of 9-11, and in some respects it seems like yesterday, in other respects it seems like 100 years ago. And as Jim was noting, there has been a, a lot has happened uh, in those uh, 14 years as far as the digital environment and what is being done there uh, by various groups that are still seeking to do us harm either here in the United States or overseas. And we just came from an open hearing earlier today where we spoke to the HIPSI, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, looking at cyber issues. And I think it was quite evident in the discussion that there needs to be more attention paid to this because it is something that we're all having to, to deal with in our jobs in terms of how it affects our intelligence mission and practices, uh, what we need to do in order to secure networks. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, I and others at CIA are in, involved right now <coughs> in a, what we call a modernization effort, right. trying to transform the agency in ways that we're able to deal with the challenges that lie ahead of us as opposed to those that we had to deal with in the la our last 68 years and bringing together the tremendous capabilities and expertise in the agency in a more integrated fashion. But at the same time, for the, the first time in 50 years, we've set up a, a new directorate on digital innovation because of the prominence that the digital uh, environment has in, in terms of all of our mm -hmm. mission areas. So when I look out over the coming decade, we're going to have all of these challenges that we're facing overseas in terms of conflict, strife, terrorism, whatever. But on top of that, we're going to have this challenge of that digital environment. And I, I do think that we as a country, and indeed internationally, we have to get ahead of it. Director uh, Rogers. Um, Catherine, thank you very You're much. Welcome. FCA INSA, thank you very much for hosting this forum. To all of you men and women for taking time from busy lives to sit down and interact, very grateful for that because as Director Comey mentioned, we have got to engender a greater dialogue and at a greater degree degree of trust between us as intelligence professionals and the nation we serve. Because in the end, we serve the citizens of the nation. That's why we all exist on this stage. For me, as the director of the National Security Agency, um, you know, I'm struck by the technical environment in which we operate is changing significantly, both as a natural occurrence and the nature of technology, and also because, again, if we're honest, the revelations that have been exposed in the last couple of years for us have made our life much more significantly difficult to generate the level of insight and knowledge on targets of interest to the nation, to all of us. Um, at the same time, the environment in which we're all working, it's difficult at times to, how do we achieve consensus as a nation on tough issues? And some of the issues we work are definitely in that category. At the same time, I'm struck by in two more weeks, three weeks we'll be entering the next fiscal year, which will mark the fifth consecutive year of declining intelligence budget. So all of us are trying to figure out how do we continue <coughs> to achieve the same level of insight, the same level of knowledge to meet our customers' expectations, whether they be policymakers or operational commanders. How are we going to do that in an environment in which resources can need to get tighter? The, the nation questions, not necessarily for bad reasons, but questions, so what are you doing and why are you doing it? Um, and yet that expectation for us to generate that level of insight never diminishes. Um, so as an intelligence professional, as a leader, these are challenging times, although I remind my workforce if it was easy, they wouldn't need us. <laughs> the second foundational thing I always remind people is all of our predecessors have been through challenges, and the biggest thing we got going for us remains unchanged, and that is the men and women of NSA, but I would argue the men and women of the organizations that I partner with, they are of such value to this nation. It's an honor to be on the stage with my six shipmates here as well as the men and women that we all lead, the way we collaborate together. Just as an intelligence professional, I don't think the relationships between our organizations and for us as leaders have, has ever been better. Thank you, Admiral Rogers. Director Kerr Dealing, please. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for helping uh, moderate today, and thank you all for attending. <coughs> Let me add a uh, personal pleasure, professional privilege to be sitting with my, my partners here uh, on the stage. Um, while I'm happy to do a few more of these with you, Jim, someday I look forward to sitting over there <laughs> and watching you up here on the stage, uh, maybe in your 10th year. <laughs> I'll be shriveled um, So let me build uh, on these thoughts. Um, you know, I, I, I have the privilege of, of leading our <coughs> geospatial intelligence profession, and uh, it, it, that profession is on the 
uh, either on the cusp or in the midst, depending on how you want to look at it, of, of, of a revolution. And that is because when I grew up in this business, we operated in the closed, um, behind vault doors, uh, lots of classification code words after every one of our products, um, very limited audience, and by the way, a very expensive business, uh, very expensive business. Um, and today, uh, while much of that is still necessary for key sets of our partners at the highest levels of policy making and military planning, more and more are we're getting a demand signal to take that success into the open. And what I mean by that is I mean in some ways to provide some reassurance to the people that fund us, the taxpayers, that they're getting a return on the investment. But two is the nature of the world. Um, um, Yes, nation states are still a threat, and I know we'll talk about uh, threats that we're, we're currently facing. But more and more, we're dealing with places without governments or with less governance and having to deal with the effects of that and the fallout of that. Uh, that's happening within an environment in which what I would call a traditional source uh, has now had the additive uh, benefit of having um, social media, uh, uh, press <coughs> reporting, uh, John's just elevated his open source enterprise uh, with, within his agency. But to me, the, while that holds great potential, it does also hold the potential for chaos, uh, analytic chaos. That is the sense that if you can't create some coherence around that noise for, our, for ourselves, but then our customers, you could be overwhelmed by it. So whereas I once learned how to hunt imagery because that's what you had to do uh, and you spent a lot of time on the hunt. Uh, today it's more of a, a filtering, gathering, seeking, understanding, creating sense out of that noise. And so uh, I would uh, add to Mike's comments, um, uh, I, I'm not worried about my current skill set. I do need this audience's help. Uh, on the technology front to help us sift through and to filter through and to create the, uh, the signals of interest or to detect the signals of interest within that noise as Mike's team has uh, done throughout the years. So a long way to say thank you all uh, for what you've done, for what you're doing, those that are teamed with us now. Uh, I look forward to our discussion here today and to furthering the relationship with everyone in the room. Thanks. Thank you, Director Stewart, please. Uh, I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I'm, I'm just sitting here with the giants of the intelligence community. This is really cool, you know? Uh, I, I'm trying to figure out how I got on the stage. It, it, and we've spent so much time together the last few days, we keep talking about teammates. They're starting to feel like family. Uh -oh. and, and, and some of the family members we don't like anymore. But anyway, <laughs> I, I won't we say like more who. Than others. We like more than others. Let's put it. So over the last two weeks, uh, it's interesting, last two weeks, we had a senior leader seminar down in Tampa talking about the Middle East, what the Middle East might look like after <clears throat> the dust settles. Where, where will we stand after the conflict over the next five years uh, plays itself out? And then I was in uh, Brunei a couple days ago talking to the Asia Pacific Intel chiefs in the region, talking about their challenges, maritime security, cyber, terrorism. And it really kind of struck me at how, and I know this sounds trite, and I know it's not unique, uh, how complex the world is now. But it, you know, it's, it's always been complex, we know that. But the, the challenge now is how quickly information moves in this complex world, and how quickly technology moves in this complex world and how it shifts the, the, the balance of powers. We think about the vitality or the importance of nation states or organizations and how, that, how they connect together. And we think about resurgent powers in regions across the globe and the competition that comes with that. And it strikes me as probably the most fascinating time, certainly in my career, for us to be an intelligence uh, in the intelligence community. So we've asked the workforce at DIA to do just one thing, to be the premier all-source intelligence agency in the world. Well, that puts me in competition with some of the folks uh, uh, in the room. I'm okay with that. 
We are pushing that organization to be the very best because the challenges that we face today and the decisions that we must feed to our decision makers, not policy makers, require all of us to compete to be the very best at this business. And failure to do so is not an option. So I, I encourage the competition, not because there isn't enough work to do, but we're gonna drive the workforce to be the very best. And hopefully during the questions, we'll talk about some of the things that we're trying to do about building the right people, building the right operating model, building the right governance so that we can in fact deliver the right intelligence at the right time to the right users. I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Director Sapp, please. Yeah, thanks, Catherine, and uh, thanks to FCN and INSA for sponsoring the event and for all of you for being here. Um, you know, I feel, again, privileged to sit with my colleagues up here. Um, we're the smallest of the big six. And uh, if you ask most of uh, the American public who NSA or CIA is, they would know. If you ask them about it in a row, they'd probably just stare at you. So let me just spend a couple minutes talking about who the NRO is and what we do. And uh, those of you in industry know as well. Um, but the rest of, us, the rest of you may not. So the NRO builds space-based intelligence collection systems. And we build the ground systems that take the ones and zeros from the space systems and turn them into information that others up here can use. Um, and so we are operating up there between hundreds of miles and tens of thousands of miles away from the Earth. And that gives us some real advantages for the IC, for the, the Americans. Um, first of all, we have great perspective, sort of a bird's eye view of what's going on. Um, we can have that global reach that space allows. We don't have to worry about geographic boundaries. We don't have to worry about making sure we have so many positions somewhere. If we get surprised by an event, we can just be there at the speed of tasking. So that flexibility is really important for the U.S. and for the USIC. And with that global reach and that flexibility, we support all the missions of the IC, everything from treaty monitoring to combating terrorism to supporting humanitarian missions around the globe. And we've been doing that for a long, long time. But it's no surprise that most Americans would have never heard of us because for the first 30 years of our existence, we were a black organization that wasn't even admitted. So we operated completely in the dark. And uh, you know, it's been fairly recently that we've come out from that. So looking to the future, we are very focused on an increasing persistence, um, time over target, being able to know what's normal and what's not normal. We're very focused on increasing our sensor capabilities. We've always been focused on that. We're very focused on, and Robert brought this up, on turning those ones and zeros into information that can be more readily used by the analysts. So having them spend less time sorting through data and more time being able to think about the data we present them. And then we're very focused on resiliency of our space systems to make sure those who need us uh, can use us no matter what threat environment we're facing. And we're doing all that in a very uncertain budget environment, as so I will have been I'd bring it up. Uh, but we're very proud of what the NRO has done through the, uh, through the 50 years of our existence. And we're very uh, confident about what we'll be able to do for the ICM for the American public in the future. Thanks. Director Sapp, thank you. Thank you all for your opening uh, statements. Uh, Director Comey, I'd like to begin with you. It's 14 years since 9-11. Are there any specific or credible threats that are tied to this anniversary? Uh, there are not any specific or credible threats tied to tomorrow. Um, there's obviously a number of threats mm -hmm. that we continue to watch. Mm -hmm. um, we've long found, as you know, in Al-Qaeda, an organization trying to motivate acts in association with that date. And we've seen some focus on date in ISIL's efforts to motivate violence in the homeland. Uh, so we got a lot on our plate. But the answer to your question is, uh, sitting here right now, there's no specific incredible. Not at this time. What do you make of the fact uh, that within the last 48 hours, we've had a message from the head of Al-Qaeda and then also the posting of digital magazines from AQAP, the affiliate in Yemen, and then also ISIS in Syria. Is this a design to capitalize on the anniversary? Are they working in concert or are they working in competition? I don't know for sure um, yet, but what we believe is that they're not working certainly in concert. Uh, um, the two organizations despise each other at this point in time, so I don't see coordination. Beyond that, I'm not exactly sure what to make of it. Um, 
given the production challenges associated with their productions. I, I can't say that they're both uh, being put out time to 9-11. I just don't know at this point. I don't know whether my colleagues want to. Anyone want to weigh in on that? On that? Well, then I have another question. <laughs> the pause is an opportunity. Great answer, Jim. Yes. <laughs> Director Brennan, uh, how would you describe the current threat environment? What do you believe it will look like in the near term? And of the three principal uh, players in this area, ISIS, AQ Corps, and Al Qaeda in Yemen, which is the most direct threat to U.S. interests? Well, I think as it was noted that there are a lot of areas right now, not just in the Middle East, but also other parts of the world that are ungoverned and which really allow these groups to put down roots as well as to um, carry out activities there and that they can use it as a springboard to try to launch terrorist attacks in other areas of the world. You identified, I think, the three principal groups, entities um, that we're concerned about, AQAP in Yemen, Daesh or ISIL, and then AQ Core. Um, and, and Daesh, uh, I, so I would put in a separate category, it's almost a phenomenon, it's not just a terrorist organization because it's taken over large swaths of territory in Iraq and Syria. But I think one of the challenges that the counterterrorism communities have had over the years is that you can't just focus on one type of threat or one organization. You always have to be prepared to continue to look for those indicators that any of these groups could be moving down the, the timeline of execution in terms of moving operatives, acquiring materiel, and uh, clearly uh, over the last couple of years because of a lot of the turmoil and turbulence in, mm -hmm. in the Middle East, I think it has allowed a lot of these groups to uh, conduct in more uh, activities where they're located, but it gives us great pause mm -hmm. because uh, certainly there has been examples of, um, particularly with ISIL, mm -hmm. trying to encourage people, uh, not only having to send people, but encouraging people through the use of the internet. And, so uh, <clears throat> with all anniversaries, we're always uh, looking to see what might be out there. Uh, but I must say the collaboration and cooperation among the various intelligence agencies, and not just on the US side, it's the cooperation with our partners internationally. Compared to where we were 14 years ago, uh, that intelligence work is light years ahead of where it was. And in addition, strengthening the defenses of this country uh, from 2001 to now. This is a much more difficult environment for terrorist groups to operate in. And on that point, uh, Admiral Rogers, when you look at the chatter surrounding this anniversary, how would you characterize it? And if it is at a high level, is this um, sort of the new normal for us? Before I uh, answer the question, just an observation, man. I feel like Captain Kirk in this chair. Okay. We've got my whites on. If we just had Sulu and I could give an order to the helm, this would be perfect. This is perfect. Uh, can you, can you on a more serious thing? note, to answer a significant question, so clearly, um, 11 September is a date that resonates with a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. It's not by chance to me that you see periodicals, you see activities being promulgated. It's a date of significance. We're the first to acknowledge that. You hear groups talking about the significance of that date. As Jim has indicated, there's nothing specifically tied to the date right now that we would raise and say, hey, there's something specific here. But there's clearly lots of ongoing activity that we play great attention to. So is the chatter high? Um, I wouldn't say it's as high as I've seen at other times over the mm -hmm. last 14 years. Mm -hmm. Is it consistent <laughs> with the high level that we are now seeing, given Director Brennan's comments about um, these groups being able to capitalize on ungoverned space? Right. I think that the greatest change in some ways is the chatter that we have always observed among groups but now groups' ability to reach out to a much broader swath of people than, quite frankly, we ever dealt with before. Now, for Jim, from a law enforcement perspective here in the nation, clearly a key issue. We're trying to look at the same phenomena overseas to see how can we provide warning and insights that facilitate law enforcement's ability to try to stop anything in the United States before it occurs. Director Cardillo and then Director Sapp, um, you were both working in government 14 years ago on 9-11. Do you believe that we have effectively broken down some of the stove piping that we saw at that time? And are we able to do that in a way now that is able to keep pace with the rapid chain of events? Director Cardillo. So the short answer is without a doubt, um, without a doubt. Um, and I you know, joined this community in 1983. Um, 
what's stronger than stove pipes, you know, iron pipes, uh, titanium pipes, you know, we, we were purposefully segregated, uh, but we could afford to be at that time because we had a very big and slow adversary. Mm -hmm. We had a monopoly on sources, and so you could take one's time and you could, you could afford, and I don't mean that in an economic sense, uh, this unwarranted duplication. Today, uh, we're one, and I'd say the bigger change, although I appreciate everyone in the room that, that's helped us on the technology side to connect us technically. I think the much bigger change is mindset. Um, uh, you know, analysts, collectors, um, staff officers are raised now and encouraged to not accept that assumption that was just proffered by that senior analyst to challenge the hypothesis for which you're asked to coordinate on a paper. And quite frankly, more today, people get offended if you don't give that feedback, which to me is, is a very healthy sign. So, plus I had the advantage before I had this job of sitting out at, at, in the DNI spaces and literally seeing how it all did come together. And, and Catherine, I, I just have to tell you, the American people should be quite proud of what this community has done and the way it's come together. And, and, it's, and it isn't just us sitting here, quite frankly, it's, it's the men and women back in the offices now who are, who, who are connected for the right reason. Director Sapp. It's been a huge change. You know, we, we in general take on engineering technology challenges all the time. The tougher challenge is always cultural. Mm -hmm. And I've seen huge cultural change since 9-11, just huge. And people willing to do things differently than they've done in the past mm -hmm. um, that you would have never seen in the past. Um, you know, intelligent integration is one of those questions we ask ourselves in our workforces every year in the climate survey, and you see these cores just climb. So it, it's, it's really been something we focused on and the, the workforce has responded. Director Stewart, part of your um, uh, goals has been uh, sort of a modernization in terms of these in regional intelligence uh, centers. Maybe just uh, elaborate on that, please. Yeah, it, it, it kind of goes to this integration question, uh, mm -hmm. quite frankly, because in the past, uh, we had uh, diffused efforts against a particular target set. So the concept is, is pretty simple, uh, and it's not something I came up with, uh, quite frankly. How do you put one individual in charge of the totality of the intelligence process in support of a regional commander mm -hmm. and uh, the regional analysis? So we build out this intelligence uh, regional center. We'll give the, uh, the director of the center all of the tools, all of the collection. Uh, go back to the last question. I have members of every one of these organizations mm -hmm. embedded within our centers and within the agency. So we're collaborating, mm -hmm. we're integrating across the space, and we're putting one person in charge of defining the questions and finding the right answers to support our operational commanders. Um, I'm gonna have another go around on one of my first questions, which is 14 years after 9-11, which group is the most direct threat to US interests? And any of you can jump in right there. Yeah, Catherine, I want to answer a specific, I would tell you, I find that among the most frustrating questions because <laughs> I think to myself, it is not about trying to tear these guys. It is about trying to figure out how do we allocate resources against priorities and how do each of these groups differentiate? They're not the same. So this simple tearing, I just find so simplistic at times where, well, tell us what the number one threat is. Pick a day of the week, pick the focus. The challenge for us as intelligence professionals is how do we develop agile organizations that can rapidly reprioritize against threats that right now we know are important, and at the same time, we're gonna see something this afternoon or tomorrow we never even thought about. And this thing about, well, tell me what the number one thing is, as you can tell, it's not a, an approach it's not that working. I really think okay. it's is not a working. smart okay. one for us. I would argue it's not a smart one for us as a nation in the long run. Captain so Kirk, I guess I shouldn't like read my one yeah. ten. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> In the number nine spot. We're going to turn now to uh, Russia and Syria. Uh, Director Stewart, what does Russia now have on the ground in Syria? Oh, good, a softball. Yeah. <laughs> I just like I, to be direct. I love it. That's remember, my remember MO. Remember how happy you would be to be up here? Yeah, I, 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 I could quite easily defer that question to 
one of my uh, stalwarts here. But, um, I read the same open press reporting that you do. Mm -hmm. It looks like Russia is moving forces in uh, to Syria. Exact numbers I probably wouldn't talk about here if I had them. But there is some indication that uh, Russian forces are moving into Syria in some numbers. And what that means is uh, the next big question. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you in the context of the buildup in Crimea and Ukraine? This is an example of new Russian expansionism. I, I think Russia wants to uh, regain what it believes is its rightful place on the international stage. And so it's going to be a player in the global stage. And so if it believes that its interests are at stake somewhere, whether that's in Syria or Crimea, it's going to use all of the things in its power to influence the action. So uh, it is not surprising, given that Russia supports uh, the Assad regime, that they would consider reinforcing the Assad regime if they felt that the Assad regime was in, uh, in trouble. So that uh, shouldn't come as a surprise to many. Can I add? Uh, please. Um, I agree with all that. And uh, their interest and presence in this part of Syria is not a new thing. Uh, they've had a naval presence in that part of the Mediterranean for decades. Right. Um, and it, you know, to Vince's point, it is their, it is their touchstone, you know, mm -hmm. for that region. Um, so Russians in Syria is not a brand new thing. I, I do agree that we're watching this development with great interest because you've got questions about, you know, why now? What's the intent? You know, where's it going from here? And that's what we do when we leave the stage and go back to our offices. <laughs> Director Brennan, he set the stage for you. What do you make of Russia's intent here? The Russians have been very candid. Mm -hmm. um, not only that they have a presence there, as Robert says, but that there is an, some additional uh, people and stuff that is finding its way into Syria. But they've been also very open in terms of their support for the Assad regime. Uh, there are decades of support that Moscow has provided to um, the Assad regimes, you know, uh, both Bashar and his father Hafez, uh, they have presence there, trainers, advisors, um, port, but also they have expressed great interest uh, about and concern over the growth of terrorist elements within those ungoverned spaces of Syria, just like we're very concerned about the growth of ISIL and Nusra. And so I think that, and they are stating that it's a dual purpose. One is to protect what is one of their client states, mm -hmm. Uh, and to make sure that Assad does not fall as a result of the uh, opposition elements there, but also because of their concern about the growth of terrorist mm -hmm. forces. Mm -hmm. We share one of those goals and objectives, right. which is uh, trying to make sure that ISIL and Nusra do not grow, um, but we do not share in any way their support uh, for the Hafez al-Assad regime because of the tremendous um, and horrific attacks that he's perpetrated upon his people. So uh, there is a difference of view between ourselves and the Russians on this issue, but I and others have spoken to our, some of our Russian counterparts about the need for us to collaborate and work together against this shared terrorist concern, because they have uh, concerns about the, their nationals who are traveling to Syria and Iraq and then traveling back to places like Chechnya, Dagestan, and other areas. What do we make of the timing? If Russia has had this capability for a year or two, why now? I think there have been a number of setbacks to the regime over the last six months. You saw Palmyra fall. Right. You saw some other parts mm -hmm. of, of Syria uh, that the re regime had control of fall to some of the opposition. And several months ago, there was quite a bit of concern as was there going to be a collapse of the regime? I think that was a misreading uh, because the regime still has a lot of troops that are there. I don't think anybody wants the collapse of the Syrian government and uh, for there to be an implosion inside of Damascus. But I think some of the setbacks that the Syrians uh, suffered probably encouraged this, the Russians to move forward with stepping up some of their assistance. Mm -hmm. I agree with John. I would take it as a recognition by the Russians, as we have come to believe, that the Assad regime increasingly is facing more and more difficulty. Okay, uh, Director Sapp, uh, the Cold War was supposed to be over. <laughs> so how does this uh, Russian aggression uh, refocus or realign uh, your assets and priorities? Um, you know, my, uh, my group does collection um, in response to tasking that comes from others, and then we hand off 
for analysis is done by others, so I'm going to follow that lead and hand off the. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on that note, uh, DNI Clapper, uh, speaking to the conference, uh, alluded to the fact that there were gaps in our intelligence collection uh, in this area. Um, what don't you have right now in your respective agencies that you want and you think is attainable? You're talking about the Russians specifically? No. I'm going to open it up. I was going to say, because I'm not really going to talk to the outside world about in a public forum about deficiencies against the, the Russians. Um, for me, I think that the challenges I look at NSA, both from our SIGINT foreign intelligence mission and our information assurance and computer network defense mission, two primary thrusts for us that just keep growing. And the cyber piece, in particular, partnering with FBI, others, CIA, um, is growing at just an exponential rate. And I'm trying to figure out, so how do I continue to generate the level of insights from a foreign intelligence perspective that the nation has come to expect at the same time, given our mission set and the capabilities we have, how can I continue to increase our ability to generate more insights, provide more capability, support computer network defense for us? I mean, let me, let, me, let me take a stab sure. at this a little bit. And I'm not pining for the Cold War era, but it was a pretty simple era. Soviet Union and the bad guys on one side, us and the good guys on the other side. It was pretty binary. Right. Uh, today we have this world where there's so much going on. Nation states that are, uh, as I mentioned, resurgence of nation states, resurgence of Russia, resurgence of China, possible the ascendance of uh, Iran in the region. So you're now starting to see a number of big states uh, who are competing with us in this space. And then you have organizations that are emerging that are radical organizations. So we now have to compete with that. And you now not only have the very simple kinetic options that you had in the, in the Cold War, but you now overlay cyber on top of that. And you overlay the information space on top of that. And the pace at which information moves, like I mentioned earlier, has made this uh, the challenge. How do you cover down on all of that and deliver the information that's necessary for our policymakers ahead of the networks? That's the real challenge today. Do you have enough depth and enough breadth to cover so many diverse issues and do it in enough detail in a timely enough manner so that you can inform policymakers. And I would say that probably none of us have enough depth and are, are positioned with enough pace to cover the globe. So that's where our partners come into play. So we leverage our international partners so that we can get greater depth. But uh, give us more, not more problems, just more help. I'll add from, yes, please. from just the geospatial seat. Um, you know, the, during the Cold War, and I talked about it, and I agree, it was very binary. We could afford both more time and less efficiency because we had that monopoly. Um, we also spent our effort, in, at least from an imagery point of view, it was in blinks. So think of you know very episodic looks or views at a particular problem set. Uh, Betty mentioned it. We need to stretch that now around the clock, uh, move to a more persistent capability, and also we need to stretch the spectrum. That is to say, to be able to, uh, to create uh, insights that are more nuanced. Vince talked about that the, the world's not black and white anymore, and, and so again, this, this room is quite helpful to us to, to create those nuanced understandings within a very noisy environment. Absolutely. I mean, we can, uh, again, see the entire globe, but where we focus is limited. And we definitely want to make sure we're improving our geoint persistence so that we can really follow a target based on the requirements that the target demands, not based on physics. Mm -hmm. um, DNI Clapper also said at the conference that the mass migration we're seeing um, from Syria and the Middle East into Europe is of biblical proportions. Director Comey, what are the implications for the FBI? How much do we understand about who these people are and whether we believe groups such as uh, ISIL or al-Nusra or Hezbollah are using this as an opportunity to embed uh, their own people? 
that's a threat we have to worry about, keep it front of our mind. And so we just have to be careful to make sure that we are scrubbing folks who are coming in here. It's great that our country opens its arms. It's sort of the lifeblood of America. We have to make sure that we understand who's coming in to the best of our ability, because there is a risk there. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at this uh, mass migration, Director Brennan, the question that comes to my mind is what fills the void? What fills this space that's left there? Is it more of the same? Does it give ISIS an, a further advantage uh, in the region? Well, that is the $64,000 question that people are trying to address right mm -hmm. now. Because if you just look at the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, they are all beset by mm -hmm. uh, great conflict, strife, refugees, movement. Um, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the migrant flow is, I think, one, one um, result. Mm -hmm. But there are many. There's a real breakdown in terms of governance. Uh, and there are questions about whether or not the central governments in these countries can uh, once more be able to gain some authority and control over the country and if there's going to be allegiance to a central government mm -hmm. when there are such rifts and strife between various sectarian groups, tribal groups and others. Mm -hmm. And there has been a breakdown of civil order and civil society in those areas that is very worrisome and I think we're losing uh, more than a generation mm -hmm. of uh, Syrians and Iraqis and Yemenis and Libyans and others because of the strife that's taking place, all the schools that are closing and the malnourishment goes up. So I think the challenges we face are you know, going to increase mm -hmm. in the coming years uh, before they, they get better. And the migrant flow again is now putting great strain outside of that region mm -hmm. that is causing additional problems. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Stewart, what is the impact for uh, these European nations, and I'm thinking sort of vis-a-vis -vis, uh, NATO and their militaries. Militaries are there in part because we're supposed to respect the borders, but what we now see is that these borders are being cast aside. Yeah. Actually, I was going to start by saying if, uh, if anybody understood biblical proportions, it would be uh, Director Claffridge. I think <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be impolite to say, but uh, I, but I, yeah. So please don't anybody tell him I said that. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell him you said that. <laughs> so yeah. Um, just between us. Just between yeah. us. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, the, the impact, uh, hard, hard to call, tell what the impact is. Clearly when you have large numbers of uh, migrants entering a, a uh, state, it has the potential to change depending on how those uh, groups assimilate within the states. So that's, that's an impact that we'll see somewhere down the road. Uh, when you had 15, 20, 30,000 folks to a, uh, to a uh, nation state, uh, it probably will change that nation state some, but we won't see that. Very limited capability, though, in most cases, to find these migrant boats and, uh, and small uh, formations and counter that with military force. So it's a significant challenge for our uh, particular our European uh, partners, and there's no easy answer to that one. Does anyone here see a day in the future where Syria will be, or Iraq for that matter, will be restored to its old borders? So, um, it's there really not going to happen any time yeah. in the near term, no. um, if at all. Have we effectively accepted that those old borders are gone? I, I don't know if anybody's accepted them, but I, 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 I'm having a tough time seeing it coming back together. Uh, it, take Iraq, for instance. I, I'm wrestling with the idea that the, the Kurds will fall back into a central government in Iraq. Yeah, I know the policy. I know what we'd like. We'd like to see Iraq as an intact state. Uh, but whether they declare independence and become an autonomous state or just mm -hmm. settle for being semi-autonomous, it's, it's pretty hard for me to see them coming back together. And then what happens out west uh, it will be played out as uh, Daesh does its thing out west. Same thing for uh, Syria, quite frankly. Uh, I, could, I could see a time in the future when Syria is fractured into probably two or three parts. Uh, again, not the ideal, mm -hmm. uh, because that comes with some uh, unknowns. How do you deal with these multiple states, fractured states, mm -hmm. uh, that might default back to ethnic and sectarian uh, uh, construct? But. Uh, that's going to be a tough one to put back together, in my view, uh, long term. 
Anyone else? Well, the borders are still there. But there's a question about whether or not mm -hmm. the governments are going to be able to uh, have oversight and be able to provide for the people within those borders. And there has been a breakdown, I think, in terms of national identity. Mm -hmm. A lot of the individuals that currently are inside of Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, do not identify themselves, first and mm -hmm. foremost, as a Yemeni or an Iraqi or a Syrian. Mm -hmm. They identify themselves either with a tribe or a sect, mm -hmm. you know, Shia or Sunni or whatever. And so that national allegiance, I think, has broken down. It's going to take quite a bit. And mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, but a lot of the authoritarian regimes that we're in place are the reason why there's been this disaffection as far as the central government is concerned. And they feel as though they, they cannot count on a central government to be able to provide them just the basic necessities of life. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, the, the Middle East is going to be seeing change uh, over the coming decade or two that is going to make it look unlike it did um, a generation ago. Yes, say what you will about mm -hmm. the regimes, right? I mean, authoritarian, dictator, dictatorial, and in many ways abusive of that power, but they defined the compact. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the social democratic compact, but it, you knew where you stood, you knew how to get things done. It might take a bribe here, it might take a favor there, mm -hmm. but you knew how to get Make through your happen, day. Right. Uh, as John said, all of that has just been lifted off. And, and also, when you, when you live under that regime, so take Gaddafi in Libya, right? You don't, you don't develop any you know, local governance and any you know, civil society uh, around that because there's one man in charge. And so I agree with John, this is going to take, so even if you took away all the kinetic activity and all the, you know, uh, you know, terrorist uh, groups uh, and militias, they would still have a very difficult hand uh, in order to recreate or to create some social compact with which to come back together. So uh, this, is not, this is not a short-term issue. Since the raid in May with, uh, and the killing of Abu Sayyaf, um, it's in the open source now that we were able to obtain a treasure trove of information, thumb drives, phones, computers, um, what can you share with us uh, in an unclassified setting what we have learned about this organization? Well, I wouldn't just tag it to mm -hmm. the um, <clears throat> raid against Abu Sayyaf. There's mm -hmm. been a lot of collection, a lot of information uh, that has been derived from good intelligence work, but also as a result of individuals who have been captured, detained, and working with our partners again with the, uh, some of the Iraqis and, and others in the area, we have been able to, um, I think, learn more about an organization that is very amorphous and it is somewhat akin to a, a water leak that just seeps out and uh, there are individuals who are in positions of very uh, of, of prominence and importance. But I think, as has been shown over the last uh, several months, I think the coalition forces that uh, have been brought together uh, against it have been able to make uh, additional progress. This is going to be, I think, a, a long effort, and intelligence is going to be so critical in terms of what we're able to do both surgically as well as more strategically, I guess, across uh, ISIL's uh, capabilities. I think it's a reflection of the same insights we have used for the last 14 years. Mm -hmm. It takes a long-term, sustained effort with multiple disciplines and a coalition of willing partners to generate insights. And those are starting to come together for us in many ways. But as John said, this is definitely a long-term focus for all of us. This is not a short-term phenomenon. Before we move on to the audience questions, because we have half an hour left, I do have some questions about uh, the Clinton server and the emails. Uh, Director Brennan and Director Cardillo, your agencies respectively have just concluded reviews of some top secret emails. Uh, what, what were the findings? I'm sorry? What were the findings? Uh, I am not gonna address that here. Okay. Okay, it's an issue that's being yeah. looked at, and so I think it'd be inappropriate for, mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, I'll tell you all about it, though. <laughs> 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 On that note, I did have a question yeah, uh, <laughs> for you. It's the kind of gentler FBI. <laughs> yeah, it is, see that. Director Comey, um, can you tell the American people that this is a serious investigation, you have all the tools at your uh, disposal that you require, and that you are free to go where the facts lead? 
I'm not, despite my joke, I'm not going to comment on, on, as we never do, on any particular investigation of ours. But I can assure the American people about this, and I hope they already know it about the FBI. We are three things. We're competent, we're independent, and we are honest. And so uh, we do all of our work that way. We don't give a rip about politics. We follow the facts where they take us, and we do our work professionally. We also do it in secret so that we don't jeopardize our ability to do it well. So my final question on that score is that under the regulations, a damage assessment is required when a classified information is compromised. So are damage assessments ongoing, and when, we, when could we expect the results of that? Who do you want the non-answer from? <laughs> <laughs> well, who has to? Yeah. You I'm are not. persistent. <laughs> but I'm persistent. As, we, as are we. And uh, I'm not certainly going to address any aspect of this in this forum, respectfully. Okay, so on to the audience questions. Um, and this comes off some of your opening statement. Where is the IC impacted by the cynicism that Director Comey describes, and to what degree has the IC contributed to this cynicism? Well, I'll take a first step. I think uh, the intelligence community, and certainly CIA, needs to do a better job of being able to uh, articulate uh, our mission, be able to explain that which we can talk about publicly, that's why I am here today, my colleagues are here today, so that there is not these deep suspicions about what we're doing. But <clears throat> unfortunately, despite some of the efforts that we've made as far as going out publicly, there is still a lot of misunderstandings, misreadings of, of what we're doing. Part of that is perpetrated by those who are de determined to undermine U.S. intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I would say that a lot of that is being fueled by some of our adversaries. So there's an active effort in, in that regard. But also I think there are uh, efforts being made to, uh, again, misrepresent what it is that we're doing. So we have to, I think, take some of this on ourselves mm -hmm. and not just you know, hide behind the curtains, mm -hmm. uh, be able to talk to the American people about what it is that we do on behalf of the American people, I think, as mm -hmm. was said here. And Catherine, that's yeah. what I meant earlier when mm -hmm. I think, at least from this seat, I've got more of an opportunity than perhaps John and Mike and, and even Vince because of the nature of the sources we use the, you know, that Betty has historically and will mm -hmm. into the future provide, but also commercially are available. It, in, it allows me to do two things. One, I can provide our professional service and support of missions, for example, as in the Ebola uh, relief effort in Liberia. Uh, because my customers there, while they wore uniforms, they were white smocks and not military uh, uniforms. Uh, without clearances and without uh, the need for accounts, et cetera. They just needed the data. And oh, by the way, the, the librarians needed it as well so that when we leave, they can use mm -hmm. information to govern better and to provide medical services better. We did the same thing in Nepal. When we went forward, uh, U.S. Marines and law enforcement and firefighters went to support. We could also provide support there in the open. And again, we're not doing it to look for credit, but I, if it can provide some assurance that, right. that, that there's a value back uh, to, in those kind of services, we're going to do more of that. Can I just add, Please. I, um, I agree very much with what's been said. The flip side of what John said is, you know, we do bear some responsibility for the mm -hmm. cynicism because right, our day jobs are so consuming that we have never really, in, mm -hmm. the, in the, certainly the last decade, taken the time to explain to the American people to lean forward and be as transparent as we can. Our, our reflex is keep it close, keep mm -hmm. it classified. They understand we got to do this work to right. protect them. And the notion of PR or outreach or a panel like this was like, are you kidding me? I'm too busy for that. And that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're trying to earn that back. I'm just going to skip to a question here because I think it's in the same thing theme, rather. Uh, given the fallout of Snowden's revelations and the CIA's enhanced interrogation controversy, how can NSA, CIA, and the IC as a whole repair its relationship with the public? I'm not afraid to be on, John. Um, from NSA's perspective, my, my first comment would be, 
I don't think we have fundamentally destroyed the nation's trust in the organization. I'm not sure that that's a universally mm -hmm. shared opinion. Okay. I'm the first to acknowledge that there are clearly some, many out there, uh, who feel that way. So what I remind our organization is four fundamentals. We obey the rule of law. We're accountable to the citizens of the nation we defend. When we make mistakes, we come forward and we acknowledge we have made a mistake and we don't cut corners. I tell my workforce, you do those four things and focus on mission because remember, the nation is counting on us. Our allies are counting on us. They need the insights that we can generate. They need the computer network expertise that we're able to provide. We cannot lose sight of why we were created in the first place. And it's up to us through our actions, both in terms of the outcomes we generate, but as well as to go to Jim Comey's point before about, um, I think broadly across the IC, if you look at what we have declassified collectively and made available to the public over the course of the last two years, I would argue, wow, it is more than I can remember in the 30 plus years that I've been doing this as a SIGINT professional. Um, and the biggest thing to my team is let our actions speak for themselves. Carry yourself the right way, do the right thing for the right reasons, and we'll get where we need to be. Yeah, I would take issue with the premise of the question, which is you know, we need to repair the relationship or the reputation with the American people. Uh, we live here in the Washington fishbowl, and everything just seems to be so much more magnified uh, in terms of what it is that we are doing here in intelligence. And I do think it's um, <clears throat> a misreading of how the American people think about what it is that the American men and women in our organizations who come from all 50 states and territories are doing day in and day out for this country. And when the polls are taken about CIA and recently, 67% uh, favorability, 70% or so, I must say that's more than double. One of the, one of the entities that's in this town that is, goes up for election every so often. <laughs> just saying that I think there's just great saying. appreciation yeah, just and saying. recognition. <laughs> I'm not supposed to afford, right? <laughs> oh, and I was doing so much better with them recently, too. I don't know if I should have said that. <laughs> it's it's my, just among us, though. It's, uh... <laughs> but my point is that I think there's real recognition on the part of the American people about how what we're doing as an intelligence community keeps them safe. And I think they are encouraged by our continuing to do it. Yes, have we made mistakes? Absolutely. But a lot of times there are misrepresentations and mm -hmm. skewed characterizations of what it is that we do, and that's where I think we need to go out there and correct the record. And even if it does mean that we're going to take on some of those other elements of the government that might have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. That's why I think we're getting to a point where now we can have that collective dialogue yeah. as a nation in a way that two years ago, quite frankly, mm -hmm. p positions were so polarized. We were talking past each other, and this was categorized as good versus bad. And I'm like, that is not how we're going to get to where we need to be. These are complex issues that we're all working on. We need to sit down as a nation and figure out what are we comfortable with? What's the right way forward? How do we meet these two incredibly important imperatives? Ensure the protection of the rights of our citizens and ensure their security and safety. And it isn't either or, we gotta do both. But you can't get there if we can't talk and work together. And you can't do that when you vilify other opinions, when you vilify other perspectives and you just talk past each other. Director Stewart, there is yet another report uh, in the news uh, today, this time the Daily Beast, that uh, the intelligence uh, on ISIS has been cooked or manipulated. And uh, the question from the audience is, what is the senior leadership of the IC going to do to ensure analytic integrity on counterterrorism issues? So uh, <clears throat> my initial instinct is to say ongoing DODIG investigation that I won't talk about. But I'll talk about it this way. Uh, we pride ourselves in the analytic rigor at which we look at the vast amount of information to deliver a, uh, an assessment to our decision makers. It is not clean, it's not science. It is as much art and experience and judgment as anything else. And so we have, when you go through the analytic process, it is a pretty rough and tumble debate. There are variations of uh, views on what the data says. And so you have this clash, this tension among the analysts about what it really means. But at some point, at the end of the day, someone has to say, this is the best judgment of what the data says and present that to our decision makers. And we take great pride in doing that. And we take great pride in the idea of speaking truth to power. I often tell the workforce, we don't serve 
a president, we serve the president, whoever that is. And so we deliver the truth wherever the data takes us. So uh, the investigation will play itself out. We'll figure out if we did something uh, wrong and we will be better as a result of a very open investigation. And that, I'll stop there. Admiral Rogers, I have a question here on uh, OPM. Another three-letter organization. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I just... Uh... Why has there not been a more robust response by the U.S. government to such a significant breach of personal information? I guess my comment would be every issue is different. So the response to Sony that you saw today mm -hmm. versus the, uh, the response to OPM, very different. Um, each different in their own ways. This clearly is a topic of ongoing discussion. Let's just let this play out. We'll see at the fullness of time uh, if we think we got it right or not. So some form of retaliation is under consideration. I, I didn't talk about what was or what was not under <laughs> consideration. But you would agree that part of uh, having credibility is exhibiting a strong deterrence. I think deterrence is an important concept that we clearly need to get to. Uh -huh. Because we have got to fundamentally change behaviors. I don't think anyone is satisfied with the current dynamics in the cyber arena. I don't think anyone, except for maybe those nations that are consistently stealing billions of dollars from us, penetrating systems, stealing information and massive amounts of PI data. They're probably the only ones who view the current situation. But it's certainly the concerning the, the open source reporting now that Russia and China are using this data that they have stolen to target intelligence operatives. I mean, this is a very serious development not that I'm going to comment on. Okay. I have a question for the NGA. What adjustments is the NGA making to its commercial imagery and programs to help ensure that the capabilities offered by proliferated small sat constellations? Is so, this, uh, okay, yes. uh, benefit DOD and the IC? Uh, well, the answer is... Yes, uh, it's a huge benefit. Um, it, it's what I was talking about in non-traditional sources in this commercialization of our business. Um, I'll say two things. One, in, in, you know, one, uh, there's a technical piece to this. Um, the, the architecture that, that I have now, uh, while it's modernizing and maturing, still has probably too much legacy in mm -hmm. that Cold War era that I talked about. We're all moving uh, into the era of uh, a more connected set of plumbing. Uh, we happen to call it EyeSight, uh, which will give us a better foundation to create even better partnerships across the stage than we have today. But I will say too, though, that because of those, those evolutions you just described are happening in the commercial world outside of our traditional architecture, I think I need to make more changes to be more open uh, mm -hmm. to the web, for example, than as I am on the classified side. So I have to make those technical changes. The other part of the question, though, is mindset again. It was mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, you know, my, we kind of raise our analyst. If it doesn't say top secret on the top of it, it can't be of value. Uh, uh, we need to open up that mindset uh, to think differently. So most specifically, the one thing I would just amend in your question is, mm -hmm. is that we actually need to think, yes, it's imagery from commercial companies, but it's also information from commercial companies. It's analytics. It's the, it's the kinds of services that, that Betty's helping us uh, think our way through on creating filters and, and cues uh, in that what is becoming more and more massive data. So it's a, it's a lot that we have to change, but we're up to it. Um, I like to say uh, the upside for NGA is outside. Uh, which really means this room. Director Comey, I have one here for you on the issue of going dark. Given that much of global commerce depends on encryption and the history of past efforts to put back doors into encryption standards, what can be done to create an encryption standard that can be trusted and that also provides the requirement of access for the government without undermining trust and security? That's a great question. I don't have an easy answer to that. And I, and I actually don't think 
it would be right for the government to be uh, coming up with the answer alone. I, I, one of the reasons I'm trying to level set and get us past the notion that we're in some sort of crypto war is so we can talk about that together because there are two values here that have been mentioned that are in conflict that I think we all share. We all care about safety and security on the internet. I'm a huge fan of strong encryption, right? If my SF-86 had been in a strongly encrypted database, maybe somebody <laughs> wouldn't be reading it today, right? I'm a big fan of that. The second thing is, I... <laughs> so encryption is a great thing for commerce, for, for government, for all of us. And we also all care about public safety. We have to together figure out a way to maximize those values because they're in conflict in a lot of different areas. ISIL is the most recent and glaring example where we go dark because of end-to-end -end encryption in a place where the stakes are incredibly high. So my answer is, I don't know uh, what the answer is. A lot of people tell me it's too hard. And my response to that is, really? Really? Have we really tried? I mean, I know of major internet service providers today who strongly encrypt their data in transit and decrypt it when it crosses their servers so they can read your email so they can sell you ads. I've never heard anybody say that they are fundamentally flawed from a security perspective, yet they comply with court orders, mm -hmm. whether that's a FISA court order or a Title III. And so is it impossible? I find that hard to believe. I also reject the notion that there's an it, right? That it is the solution. There may be a thousand different solutions, uh, but we need help together trying to figure out what they are and get past the venom and the demonization. Maybe we end up at the end of the day saying, you know what, the costs of this are so great that we will accept the increased uh, problems with public security, with public safety, because it's it, it would be too costly to do on the other side. Okay, I just don't think we've really tried that because nobody in the private sector has been truly incentivized to try and figure this out. And what I'm asking, in fact begging is, please, because we care about the same things, let's see if we can't figure a way out to achieve both of our goals. Thank you. Uh, I, Director Sapp, I have one for the NRO. Is the NRO experiencing any new threats to its on-orbit assets, and how is it dealing with these challenges? We're certainly seeing a proliferation of space threat, and uh, so we are taking those very seriously, just as the Air Force is. We are making sure we can operate here. We've got, a, we've got a mic issue. Stand by a second. Let me just... Here, let me uh, give you the question again, because we missed it. Is the NRO experiencing any new threats to its on-orbit assets, and how is it dealing with these challenges? We're certainly seeing a proliferation of space-based threats, um, and we are making sure that both our space systems, space systems and our ground systems are in good shape. <laughs> Tech Thank assist. You. All right. <laughs> we're going to make sure we can operate through any of those threats. So that is what we're very focused on that. Okay. Is the intelligence community pivoting to Asia <laughs> and the need to contain an aggressive China in the East and South China Seas? Well, clearly Asia is a area of major uh, concern and interest in the part of the United States across all of the various areas, uh, whether it be on the diplomatic front, on the commercial front, trade, and also on the intelligence front. So as we talk about the Asia pivot, because of the tremendous growth of China, as well as some of the challenges that are there in terms of the uh, areas of, of tension uh, in the seas, as well as issues related to the Korean Peninsula, uh, concerns about North Korea, uh, this is something that the intelligence community has to be postured to be able to support our policymakers, as well as our, our military that uh, you know, guards the large portions of the Pacific. Uh, so this is something that, as we have talked about, we're facing a series of budget cuts over the years. The world hasn't gotten smaller. In fact, in many respects, it's gotten larger because of all of the different challenges we face there. So the Asia pivot is nested within, I think, the, the, the broad array of challenges that we face worldwide. But definitely, uh, at least from the CI perspective, uh, Asia is a critically important uh, part of the world. I think it's true for all of us, and as John said, the challenge gets to be pivoting implies increased focus, I think, to many people. It argues to me, so what potentially you're going to decrease your focus on, and that is always the hardest answer. It's not what are you going to prioritize. To me, the hardest answer is, so what are you going to de-prioritize? That's the real challenge. 
We have a question here about uh, domestic threat assessments. Although performed on the foreign side, there is no whole of government intelligence domestic threat assessment. This prevents creation of a unified mission package and also a unified budget and unified oversight. Would you support an annual domestic threat assessment serving as the basis for mission and budget? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, when the DNI goes in front of Congress, whenever they ask, but annually to do worldwide threat, he's he's there for one reason. He's 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 laying out he's his understanding in the of domestic the threat. Piece too, Correct, is that what you're as, it, okay. as it comes back to us. So again, I don't know if the question meant something else, but quite frankly, okay. we're all here for domestic security. Um, we just do it by our views of foreign threats. And I'll, I'll move on to the next. And Director question. Comey. Oh, sure. um, do you feel that your requirements are currently satisfied in terms of a whole of government domestic threat assessment? In the main, one mm -hmm. of the things that Jim Clapper is trying to do is make sure that we are thinking about it uh, in a better way. He's uh, using a framework that we call the domestic DNI rep framework, where we have regions around mm -hmm. the country. Look, the FBI is obviously the big dog domestically uh, when it comes to intelligence, but we want to make sure we're knitting together the other domestic agencies like DEA, like ATF, like the things that our state and local partners are learning. So I think we're doing it pretty well. I think he's spotting something that could even make us better. That's why he's driving that framework. Okay. Um, we have a question here on climate change. If someone could elaborate on the national security threat implications. Well, we just uh, spent a good amount of effort uh, in, in support of the uh, president's uh, trip last week uh, to the Arctic. Um, uh, most of our support was uh, in, in combination with the National Science Foundation. And this is to provide, again, I talked earlier about how can we uh, be more contributory in the open. So this is to do a better understanding of the baselining of what is exactly happening uh, in the Arctic what has been happening over the past uh, a few years. And again, without getting into the why it's happening, we can do the documentation. One thing that we do know is that the, those sea lanes that used to be closed for a good part of the year are open. Uh, territory that used to be inaccessible is mm -hmm. now accessible. Part of our job is to monitor activity in and around that. Much of it's economic, but some of it uh, is security-based, and it's our responsibility to provide insights and warning as appropriate uh, to those activities in the Arctic because it's now a more accessible area. I have a question here which I think uh, Director S uh, Sapp is probably best to address. Can you discuss your progress on building a joint ICDOD space center? Are IC officials likely to command a DOD asset in the event of attack? Well, we're talking about uh I don't know because it's not my question, but this is the, <laughs> the best that I have here. So it's something called yeah. a jigs box, okay. which right. is going to be a, a joint center working on mm -hmm. unity of effort across the IC and the DOD to make sure we can have, again, a unified integrated response to space threats. So it's just, uh, it's just getting underway where we're going to practice um, toward where we need to be in that kind of environment. The next question from the audience is, how are you encouraging IC professionals to legally report illicit intelligence activity and reassuring those professionals their career will not suffer? Well, I'll say for me, it's as a leader by ensuring I am setting an expectation about mm -hmm. what my expectations are. And I bring this up in the topic of what does it mean to be a professional? We want to call ourselves intelligence professionals. That means we have a responsibility to stand up when we see things that are being done incorrectly. As a military officer, I was always taught when you receive an order that is illegal, immoral, unethical, it is your duty as a professional to stand up and bring this to attention and say, hey, look, we've got a problem here. And I tell our workforce, I expect you to do the exact same thing. And the flip side is, if I find out you are aware of something and you did not choose to do that, I will hold you accountable as a professional because I don't want there to be any doubt about what our expectations are. You must come forward with what you believe to be wrong or incorrect. Doesn't mean we're always going to agree, but I want the expectation to be that's what we do. And that's part of being a professional. I respect professionals and I'm not going to take action against someone because they were being professional. 
I mean, making sure that professionals understand what the mechanisms are and ways to raise concerns mm -hmm. if they see something that may be out of sorts. There are ways to do it inside of one's component uh, within the organization, whether it be the IG or others, congressional oversight. Uh, but uh, there is no reason why somebody should take that issue and find themselves in the, uh, in the arms of one of our uh, <coughs> adversaries. And, uh, <laughs> I think in, in that sense that I completely agree in, what's happening now at Central Command is healthy. Somebody raised an issue, might be right, might be wrong, but there's a process now to deal with it. And quite frankly, I'm more worried about the people that aren't coming forward. So to Mike's point, we've got to create the atmosphere that lets people know that we not only you know, accept it, but we expect it. it it's, it's part of your responsibility. The only thing I'd add is I think we as leaders need to celebrate right. people who raise their hands. If they, even if they turn out that they, they had a reasonable concern but it turned out to be a misunderstanding, we have to celebrate them. We've got to hug them with our words. We've got to give them awards. We have to make sure that we're signaling this isn't just talk about the importance of raising your hand. Okay, we've got, I've got three questions here and I think we have time uh, for all three. Before we wrap up, uh, let's see. The ODNI was formed after 9-11 to aid interagency communication. What could be done, added, or taken out now to further aid that level of communication? Well, I think the DNI has done a great job, and Jim Clapper in particular, mm -hmm. as you mentioned before, with the eyesight construct, mm -hmm. making sure that the intelligence community is able to work together. To me, what the real challenge is, is trying to find the the optimal framework and what's the systems engineering that's required to be able to bring in all those different nodes and networks and databases and uh, agencies and responsibilities and authorities. That I think is going to continue to, I think, challenge us in the, in the years ahead. But that's why you do need somebody who's going to be able to orchestrate this across the community and Jim Clapper has done it superbly. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think eyesight has been sort of the mechanics behind it, but he has really stressed intelligence integration mm -hmm. from the time he came into office. And he and Stephanie O'Sullivan um, have not only stressed that they've lived that and they get us together more often and there's more forms where we work jointly together. So I, I think he, they've both been a great force for bringing us together. There is a distinct lack of cybersecurity experts nationally. Every agency is looking to expand the workforce in terms of cybersecurity experts. How can universities, academia, work with the intelligence agencies and community to help produce more graduates with the necessary skill set? So, so for us at NSA, it's a conscious investment. We have partnerships with academic institutions around the United States. Four days ago, I was in Salt Lake City, talking to five different educational institutions in the greater Salt Lake City area about what can we do to partner with you, both in computer science in particular, although language was another area. Um, we're doing that around the nation. It, clearly, it's a foundational investment, both I think for the good of the nation and quite frankly for all of us, for many of us at least, mm -hmm. to execute our mission sets. We're gonna need to expand the pool of expertise because we're all out there trying to find the same things. And the other thing for me is I also spend time out in Silicon Valley because we're, I remind them, we're trying to recruit the same workforce. So help me understand what works for you, what doesn't work, mm -hmm. what's effective, what have you done to try to retain people, what have you found that, that didn't work that perhaps I might be able to do that doesn't work in your system? And the only thing I'd add is it's so hard, our interests actually diverge here because we compete against each other a little bit. <laughs> But uh, it's so hard that we also have to get better at finding people with the right values and abilities and quickly teaching them the skills. Because we're just not gonna get by hiring people who have been pre-trained. There aren't enough of them to go around. Throughout the conference, we've heard the IC leaders say they need industry to help solve some of your major problems. Can you provide examples of how we, the industry, can help? Across the board, um, I think it was mentioned either this session or the early one we had today, which, where the U.S. government really um, relies so much on the private sector for that innovation, for that creativity, for being able to pull together 
the, the teams that are going to give us the capabilities that we need so that we can apply it to our government responsibilities. Uh, you know, whether it's on the, the major collection system satellites, all the way down to miniaturized uh, uh, collection systems and methods, uh, analytics, uh, database, open source, social media, uh, you know, across the board, we look to the great um, innovation of the U.S. private sector to be able to help us, and that's why I think all of us have a number of um, <clears throat> irons in the fire here. You know, we here at CIA, partnering with others, working with InQtel to make sure that we're able to f fuel some of these um, efforts to make sure that they're able to design things in support of the types of things that, that we need in order to keep the American people safe and secure. For, for a long time, we've talked about the promise of open source data. We now have uh, the tools, or I hope industry will help us to get the tools, to really exploit the incredible amount of data that's available in the open source, publicly available, no expectation of privacy, to, to focus the intelligence collection effort. So I think uh, industry can help us, and I know it sounds trite to talk about big data, mm -hmm. but the volume and the velocity of data that exists today in the public domain that can be helpful in shaping the collection posture, shaping our analysis, is an area that I think industry can really help us with. I uh, feel strongly that, uh, and say often, that I think of the members in this room as part of our team. I mean, uh, and it's not just a glib phrase, it, because it's true. Um, I would ask you this, though. Uh, many of you, and probably on my way out today, as you, you know, they'll say how we're doing, you'll say, eh, you know, you're trying a little bit, we're seeing a little more innovation, mm -hmm. wish you could be more agile, wish you could be more quick, wish you could, you know, shorten the time frame between this and that. And I get all that, and we're trying to do it, and by the way, I need your help to do that. Um, uh, it's a two-way street, and I, I need you all, okay, to both leaning in and, quite frankly, to be questioning your procedures and your practices, because the more agile we are, oh, by the way, the less six years contracts I'm going to be putting out, right? And I know the, those are good, okay, for some, uh, but then we, we buy down on the other, other side of it. So all I'm saying is we're, we're trying really hard. Uh, <laughs> to build some of that agility in, I just ask for your continued help. One, again, constructive criticism, but two, reaching your hand out as well. And I'll say, too, the industry is a huge partner for the NRO. We don't build anything at Westfields. We all, we contract out <laughs> with you. And uh, not only for the core systems, but for the research and development that's just key to getting us into the future where we need to be. So, great partners. Thank you, and with that, I would like to thank all of the directors for being here today, for your questions from the audience, and for your service. Thank you.